I'm Dave Meinhardt. I'm with the Vaticuti Foundation. It's really a pleasure to have you all joining us today, and especially our two surgeons that have volunteered their time to put this program together for us. Dr. Raghunath S.K., who's the Director of Uro-Oncology and Robotic Surgery at Trustwell Hospital and HCG in Bangalore. And then our moderator for today is Dr. Gagan Gautam, who has been a mentor to many with the Vaticuti Fellowship Program. And so I want to thank them for joining us. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Gautam. And it's really wonderful because not only am I getting the pleasure to introduce uh, a really fantastic uro-oncologist who's been a very close colleague of mine over, over many years, but also a great friend. And uh, uh, as you can see, and he is an extremely uh, qualified and em eminent uh, uro-oncologist to be actually taking these lectures today. So Dr. Raghunath uh, is the Director of Urologic Oncology and Robotic Surgery at Trustwell Hospital and HCG uh, Cancer Hospital in Bangalore. And he is also the co-founder and director of the Trustwell Hospital in Bangalore, which is a 220-bedded hospital in the Central Business District of Bangalore. Uh, after completing his uh, residency from, in urology from the uh, Muljibai Patel Urological Hospital in Nadiad, he, actually, he did his fellowship in Euro-Oncology from Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute and Research Center in New Delhi. And then he also had a stint at Taipei City in, in Taiwan, where he was selected for a fellowship in laparoscopic and robotic urology. He's also had a very distinguished uh, career after that. He spent uh, some time in the Walter Reed Army University at Maryland, Washington, DC, uh, where he was a visiting fellow in molecular oncology for prostate cancer. And of course, he that's probably what gives him a really great edge when it comes to the basic as well as the uh, clinical uh, research, which he's done a lot. And in fact, he has conducted more than 18 clinical trials in the field of prostate and kidney cancers. He's got more than 20 national and international publications and has performed more than 4,000 uro-oncological surgeries in his distinguished career. But I still get the impression that he's just starting off. And I think by the time he's done, he would have done 40,000 or so. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, you know, he's also somebody who just doesn't stick with surgeries and academics. Uh, he's an entrepreneur. He's one of the co-founders of the Trustwell Hospital in Bangalore. And at the same time, he also is the co-founder of a medical technology company, Comorphy, which is a startup in Bangalore and is involved in the development of robotic devices to assist surgeons to perform complex procedures. Uh, and to top it all, he's also a, a certified TEDx speaker and he has taken TED Talks in the field of robotic surgery that I also had a pleasure to, to listen to uh, last year in 2019. Uh, so without uh, much further ado, uh, above all, I would like to say that he's somebody who's an amazing person. He is a fantastic surgeon. And he is also a wonderful human being with whom it's always a pleasure to interact with. So now I'll need another webinar to actually complete his introduction. But uh, you know, before we go ahead, I would like to invite Dr. Raghunath to take over the proceedings. And initially, he would be starting off with a lecture on uh, RPLND and its role in testicular cancer, especially in the post-chemotherapy setting. And then he would also be giving a video presentation on robotic RPLND. And we would have couple of rounds of discussion in between that and after that, so that uh, we can really get into the depth of this topic, which is indeed a vexing topic and a topic of growing interest with the introduction of minimally invasive surgery in this field. So thank you very much uh, for this opportunity and uh, over to Dr. Raghuna. Thank you, Dr. Gagan, for very kind words. At the outset, I would like to thank uh, Vatikuti Foundation, Dr. Bandari. Very good evening to all of you. My talk is on robotic RPLND post-chemotherapy for NSGCT. I would be restricting my talk only to post-chemotherapy NSGCT. However, I would like to give briefly touch upon what is RPLND, what are the nuances of RPLND. Then we will go to the techniques. So robotic post-chemotherapy RPLND for testicular tumor is generally required after chemotherapy if nodes are of more than one centimeter. We all know compared to primary RPLND, post-chemotherapy RPLND is more complex procedure because of these reasons. 
generally disease burden would be higher and post chemotherapy induced desmoplastic reaction can make the surgery complex the compromise of pulmonary renal and hematological status due to chemotherapy or due to disease status itself and it also increases the likelihood of post operative complications because of his complexity of the technique so when it comes to open rplnd it is now standard of care however with the growing experience with robotic retroperitoneal surgery many centers have adopted robotic technology with this definitely it reduces the post operative morbidity while maintaining the oncological efficacy when it comes to rplnd there are several types of rplnd we describe it is described in the literature one is prophylactic anti uh, rplnd the therapeutic rplnd and what we are going to discuss is post chemotherapy rplnd and lastly desperate rplnd so i would rest restrict my talk to uh, post chemo rplnd however i would be touching briefly on other types of rplnd what is prophylactic rplnd where it is indicated it is indicated for nsgct stage 1a and 1b what is the rationale for prophylactic rplnd it is required because 30% of stage 1 disease harbor occult mats in the retroperitoneum what are the advantages of prophylactic rplnd definitive pathological neural staging is possible and it could be curative by the surgical technique alone however some disadvantages are there because of surgical morbidity and it could be over treatment in some cases when it comes to therapeutic rplnd it is indicated in stage 2 preferably low burden and always marker negative disease the advantages of this are complete removal of viable germ cell tumor and sometimes chemo resistant teratoma can be there so by giving chemotherapy we are not going to cure this so to take care of this chemo resistant teratomas therapeutic rplnd could be required when it comes to post chemotherapy rplnd it's indicated in setting of normalized tumor markers all, always except desperate rplnd before planning rplnd the tumor markers should be normal and there should be radiographic evidence of residual retroperitoneal masses preferably more than 1 cm when it is less than 1 cm and pet ct is not showing any activity probably we can observe it is generally done 6 weeks following chemotherapy why we should do and what are the after effects what we see in the histology of the retroperitoneal specimen after induction chemotherapy necrosis or fibrosis is seen in around 45% the teratomas are seen in around 40% however viable gct which is very important which is present in 15% of the cases after second line chemotherapy the numbers vary viable gct is present in almost 50% and teratoma is almost same about 40% necrosis and fibrosis is relatively less what about residual masses post chemotherapy necrosis is present generally 40% plus and in this scenario the prognosis is generally good with 5 years disease free survival is around close to 90% when it comes to teratoma again which is seen in 40 to 50% prognosis is again excellent and five years disease specific survival is this is free survival is around 80 to 90% when it comes to carcinoma the prognosis is relatively poor and the five years disease free survival drops to around 45 to 60% so this group of patients would require two more cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy why it is important to remove teratoma because teratoma though it is benign it is biologically unpredictable left unresected possesses the potential to invade adjacent organs particularly the renal vessels and the bowel and what we call it as growing teratoma syndrome can occur and it also undergo malignant transformation which increases the risk of late relapse finally desperation rplnd i will just briefly touch upon this when we do it persistently elevated or increased tumor markers after primary induction chemotherapy and failed salvage chemotherapy so completely resectable retroperitoneal masses 
and technically it is definitely difficult than even post chemotherapy because they would have received multiple cycles of chemotherapy and the five year survival rate would be around 20 to 55 percent before understanding rplnd it is important to know the nerve sparing rplnd so the sympathetic fi sympathetic fibers that mediate seminal, seminal emission originates primarily from the t12 and l3 up to t12 to l3 thoracic lumbos, lumbar spinal cord so this uh, you can make out the post ganglionic sympathetic fibers which arises from the ganglia and just below the inferior mesenteric artery and above the bifurcation of the aorta these forms and called uh, uh, this joint to form uh, hypogastric flexors so before understanding the rplnd technique it is important to know the nodal regions these are the general nodal regions which is uh, in relation to cava and aorta so these are paracaval precaval intraaortic caval preaortic paraaortic right suprahilar generally we don't consider uh, a 6 and 7 that is suprahilar when we do standard this is outside the template sometimes we do whenever lymph nodes are present around the renal hilum above the renal hilum and the right iliac left iliac inter iliac right gonadal vein and left gonadal vein though this is not standard description uh, but some literature says these are the groups of lymph nodes which we may have to consider while doing rplnd types of rplnd it could be either extended template or standard template the standard template is bilateral infrahilar however extended template as i told you may be required in uh, some situations so where we remove even bilateral suprahilar lymph nodes and nerve sparing should be possible in most of the cases it requires uh, expertise and depending on the scenario we can consider nerve sparing rplnd so these are the templates i would not go into the details of this all of you know about this this is the modified right template generally we restrict this section above the inferior mesenteric artery again when it comes to the left template again we do not remove the nodes around this area because hypogastric flexors will be injured and which causes retrograde ejaculation so this is the bilateral template when it comes to rplnd these are very important to understand these complications retrograde ejaculation if you don't preserve the neural nerves and infertility prolonged ileus because we dissect in the retroperitoneum and hemorrhage is a possibility because we deal with uh, great vessels ureteric injury if you don't identify the ureter because of desmoplastic reaction ureteric injuries are very common and injury to major viscera lymphocytes are common because it is lymphadenectomy wound infections atelectasis pulmonary embolism and bowel obstruction because of uh, additions and wound additions generally mortality is less than 1% so with this i would like to just end this presentation uh, this completes the introduction of rplnd thank you fantastic uh, ragunath always thank wonderful you, to hear you and uh, a very nice uh, summary of the entire rplnd situation uh, that we sometimes face i have a few questions for you and we we have uh, uh, you know if, if there are any questions that uh, that any you know, kind of elaboration that you want to do we can ab absolutely go ahead and do that but some of the questions that i had was that you mentioned about nerve sparing in rplnd how applicable is actually nerve sparing in the post chemotherapy setting is it possible it is very difficult it is it's very difficult uh, it depends on the nodal burden as well if the nodal burden is relatively less probably one can attempt it also depends on the expertise and experience if if yeah. A surgeon has done plenty of, uh, you know, nerve sparing or pain is probably one can consider. Otherwise, it's very very difficult. Right. So, how how do you counsel uh, the patients? Uh, what are the salient points that you talk to uh, these gentlemen about when you are offering them uh, post chemo or pain? So generally, we tell about uh, uh, retrograde ejaculation, and of course, they would have all undergone chemotherapy. The sperm banking is very very important. They would have done. all those things so we counsel about retrograde ejaculation uh, if the patient is willing to 
undergo this you should they should be prepared to you know uh, expect all these eventualities and sometimes we do take opinion from andrologist if they're not completed their family generally these patients are young we always take an opinion from an andrologist how they can uh, resolve the fertility issues post surgery so so you you mentioned andrologist is one of the people that you would be considering it and when you when you take a decision for uh, rplnd what is the uh, how do you take a is do you have a kind of a tumor board meeting do you have a multidisciplinary uh, kind of a panel which decides uh, is it uh, or is it a you know just a surgeon and the patient interaction no 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 no, no. whenever we uh, undertake this kind of a major decisions always we interact with the uh, uh, medical oncologist when it comes to surgery it depends on the complexity of the surgery if it is involving the bowel we involve gastro surgeon and when vascular problems can come so we always involve the vascular surgeon so it's a multidisciplinary approach so before planning surgery itself we have to take opinion from all these specialists okay and uh, you, you you mentioned that the chances of a uh, you know having a viable tumor in when when you've already received two cycles of chemotherapy two different uh, schedules of chemotherapy are about uh, 40 50% whereas it's only about 10% when only one cycle of one uh, session of chemotherapy one cycle of chemotherapy has been given uh, or first line chemotherapy has been given i should say uh, what, how does in your experience how has the difficulty of performing the surgery varied with the increase in the number of lines of chemotherapy or the number of cycles of chemotherapy uh, in your experience uh definitely a lot of uh, fibrosis will be there desmoplastic reaction will be there uh, generally we give three cycles of uh, bep or at least four cycles of uh, ep will be given so a lot of fibrosis will be there so only experienced persons should be able to do this one and we should always be ready to convert to open that should always be there so we can't just uh, we can't just yeah. convince the patient that we are going to complete robotically always yeah. you should take consent for open so any time if any vascular complication is there or you are not progressing with the surgery always be ready to open so ragu you Because are this you are, are in complex that surgery. yeah absolutely so you you are in the unique uh, situation uh where you have actually been a very extensive and and and, and a very good uh, open neuro oncological surgeon and yeah, in the initial years of your experience and then you have you know taken to the robot like a fish takes to water and you have been able to convert almost all uh, open surgeries into robotic surgeries and of course uh, you know you're doing a fantastic job in that but how do you Uh, at this particular point with all the experience that you have of all the uh, uro oncological surgeries do you still sometimes you would tell the person that look you know i don't think i'm going to do a robotic in your case and if yes then how do you take a call on in rplnd regarding deciding open versus robotic approach yeah it's a very uh, important uh, uh, question listen uh, whenever large bulky nodes are there maybe more than 5 cm probably i would prefer to go with open surgery and we should also look into a ct scan whenever the nodal involvement is encircling the major vessels if it is encircling more than 270 degrees so my chance of conversion to open will be relatively higher up to 180 degrees probably i would consider meaning to say if it is involving the uh, aorta or ivc to around 180 degrees uh, i am comfortable if it is more than that always the risk of conversion will be more so i tell them in advance that risk of conversion uh, to open surgery will be relatively more in such cases and this question by the way was uh, asked by our good friend ginel uh, who uh, who is uh, watching very closely to what you are saying so uh, the uh, other thing that i wanted to discuss with you about was uh, the role of rplnd in seminomas and how do you firstly take a call on operating uh, seminomas in the post chemotherapy setting and do you have any experience of doing them robotically open because i believe they are much tougher than doing uh, a regular yes, rplnd yes absolutely to tell you honestly i have not done uh, uh, rplnd for seminoma post chemotherapy uh, it's a very rare scenario i have not come across any such uh, scenarios so 
very few people have done uh, seminomas indian experience is very very limited uh, only i uh, searched through the literature uh, camel et al has done uh, three uh, rpl indies robotic rpl indies uh, for seminoma it is definitely tougher than uh, uh, doing rpl indie for nsgcp because desmoplastic reaction is uh, more seen with post chemotherapy seminomas so it's technically Absolutely. challenging to tell you honestly i have not done uh, single rpl well, indie for that, seminoma that that makes two of us for sure <laughs> I, I hope, <laughs> Dr. Bhandari, you want to uh, say yeah, something? Yeah, I have. I have a couple of questions. Wonderful! It was very, very uh, uh, good exposition to the youngsters, making every smaller point clear. Thanks, Raghu. I have two questions. Number one, you alluded to that one of the conditions for RPL end in this format is that the there should be a complete response. Tumor markers have to come down to normal, isn't yes. it? Yes, sir. Absolutely. Now, so I have two interrelated. What is, in your experience, partial or no response after second chemotherapy cycle? If it is, the disease is confined only to the retroperitoneum, big masses are there. In such cases, we consider desperate RPL and where we know okay. this tumor it goes this tumor under the, yeah. so desperate RPLND. definitely my question was that if there is a partial response or no response because even in complete response you find uh, non tumorous masses 40% and you find yes. cancerous masses so yes only the, it's not a very rigid criteria that if it is there you throw it out or kind of thing second question is do you feel this is related to my area of interest do you feel any kind of intraoperative assistance in terms of uh, immersive virtual reality would help you to do a good job or you just uh, go definitely so right? when it comes to the surgeon surgeon should have experience of uh, at least performing a few open surgeries and when it comes to robotics definitely you should have done at least good complex surgeries robotically then only he can take up this challenge it is not just the surgeon it is the assistant also should have equally competent uh, you know exposure no, I, and experience. I, I am talking i am talking bracketing excellent surgeon like you that if i give you a 3d uh, computer vision model with the immersive it, it thing, which will tell you every node yes sir that will that will definitely enhance my because perception. Because I remember the time aunt. in Germany in the seventies, they used to have lymphangiography, and they will go on working till they find every node. It would be an exercise for ten to twelve hours. So, and if that be so, then we should talk outside this sometime, and we can really work out because this is one area where I believe completion of surgery would have a great impact on the outcome. Gagan, I think uh, uh, Janil is here, and if you would like to involve him at some point for discussion, Dave would be very happy to do so because uh, uh, I absolutely would exactly be very happy. We to... wanted to have uh, a panel of experts, and so we would love that. I mean, involve him. So whenever no, you feel like you can, well, right, him, right now, make actually. him into a speaker. No, let me take Gini... this opportunity to invite uh, Dr. Ginil, is close friend of mine, and. The specialty of Guinea is he has probably done a maximum number of retroperitoneoscopic RPL indies. And in the last EAU, he won the prize uh, for his video on retroperitoneoscopic uh, RPL ND. So, welcome, uh, Guinea. My pleasure to have you here. Uh, and so, so before we uh, get the video, uh, Raghu, just one uh, last question that I had in mind for you. Uh, and that is that yes, you, know, you mentioned about the lines of chemotherapy and the, and the chemotherapy there. Uh, you know, bleomycin, BEP, your three cycles of chemotherapy is one of the favorite uh, regimens that you use and, you know, most of us use for, in this situation. Uh, how, how does the, uh, you know, history of giving bleomycin impact on, firstly, the preoperative workup uh, from an anesthesia point of view? And secondly, your decision with regards to going in. So bleomycin, all of us know, it's a uh, pulmonary toxicity is known. Pulmonary fibrosis is uh, very well known with uh, bleomycin. Uh, we always interact with uh, medical oncologists, which uh, regimen they are going to follow. 
whether it's three cycles of BEP or four cycles of EP. So results of BEP and EP are almost same. When it comes to surgery, uh, if the person has undergone BEP and we always take opinion from uh, pulmonologists, we check for pulmonary function test whether they are a can they are candidate for general uh, anesthesia. We also interact with uh, our anesthetist. If their pulmonary function is adequate enough, then probably we can consider uh, robotic. If their pulmonary function is compromised, then probably uh, because robotic surgery is always done um, under general anesthesia, in such situation, probably we may have to uh, go for open surgery if the pulmonary function is not all right. Fantastic. I think that's uh, very important for so all of us to understand. Yeah. Yeah. Function evaluation so is have, very important. Absolutely. And we have to look at it from, from the surgical aspect as well as the anesthesia related aspect before we decide on the uh, mode of the surgical procedure. I think we had a great discussion on the initial theoretical aspect of RPLND, and now we can take some tips from Dr. Raghu regarding the robotic approach. Uh, and I would be I, looking forward to the presentation of a video of robotic RPLND, and I would request Dr. Raghu to uh, go ahead and uh, share his screen and, and present. And so, when it comes to surgical technique, uh, the surgical approach decide taking into account the histological findings, staging of the disease adjacent organ involvement, whether to involve GA surgeon or sometimes any, any complex uh, uh, you know, uh, tumors are there, uh, we may have to involve even vascular surgeon. So this consideration should be made uh, before the surgery. And it also depends on treatment effect based on the imaging approach. Uh, we have uh, either transperitoneal and retroperitoneal. Um, predominantly, I have done uh, transperitoneal approach. I've tried after getting uh, you know a uh, lot of inspiration from uh, Dr. Ginnell. I've tried one uh, retroperitoneoscopic, but I had to convert to open surgery uh, because of pneumoperitoneum. Otherwise, uh, technically it is uh, uh, similar to transperitoneal. And when it comes to patient position, uh, these are the, there are two different types of approaches. One is a flank approach and uh, another one is supine Trendlenburg approach. So this, uh, these are the uh, positions for uh, uh, flank approach. This is the left RPLND flank approach and right RPLND flank approach. So this is the camera port, 11 camera port. This is uh, uh, related to XA system uh, port placement. Uh, it will be slightly different for SI system. The assistant port will be around 12 millimeter, 10 or 12 millimeter port will be there. Otherwise, these are the 8 mm ports. When it comes to uh, right RPLND, it is the mirror image of the left RPLND. So, so there will be three 8mm robotic ports and additional either 5 or 12mm ports are required. Generally, to apply 10mm uh, uh, hemolog clips, uh, we prefer to go with uh, 10 or 12mm uh, assistant port. We don't try with 5mm assistant port. So this is the port placement for bilateral template or when we try to uh, do with a supine Trendenberg position. So there is some difference between uh, SI system and uh, XI system port placement. So here, for SI system, always the head and docking is required uh, and it is almost opposite of uh, docking for prostate cancer i mean radical prostatectomy you see here in the midline the 30 degree camera will be here just uh, three four centimeters above the supra pubic uh, uh, so pubic symphysis and right and left uh, robotic arms and assistant port it depends on the requirement if assistant is excellent, probably one uh, assistant port is more than enough. Sometimes you may have to do, uh, you may have to use two assistant ports, one 5mm for suction. And simultaneously, uh, if you want to suck and apply uh, hemolog clips, maybe two assistant ports are advisable in some situations, some complex situations. When it comes to XI system, this is the port placement. Uh, the ports are generally in single line and it is three to four centimeters below the umbilicus. And the 12 mm assistant port, it could be either on the right side or on the left side. And as I told you, position is Trendenburg position, which facilitates bowel retraction. And the problem with the SI system is gonadal vein removal may need additional port placement. However, that may not be required with the XI system. And in such cases, we may have to change the position and change the port placement to remove the gonadal vein or the spermatic cord, which is left inside the abdomen. What are the steps of uh, post-chemo RPLND? Uh, 
uh, these are the steps mobilize the bowel expose the retroperitoneum by incising the posterior peritoneum split and roll technique is standard technique uh, after identifying the great vessels you have to uh, split and then roll and dissect after completing unilateral template dissection the patient position is changed for contralateral template in case if it is required uh, that is required only in case of uh, flank approach in supine approach you will have great exposure to both the great vessels and at the end of the procedure after lymphadenectomy you close the posterior peritoneum so that the it prevents a lot of additions with the great vessels and placement of drain is optional many people experienced people do not use however in all of our cases I have used the drain so i would like to present uh, this particular uh, patient's uh, video here we have 38 years gentleman with a left scrotal swelling he completed his family which is very important uh, sometimes sperm banking may be required in uh, some cases however in this case he completed his family despite of that he stored his uh, his sperm banking was done evaluation showed left testicular tumor with a retroperitoneal nodes with elevation of uh, afp the CT scan showed paraiotic and aortic cable multiple, mildly enhancing enlarged discrete hypodense lymph nodes. Largest one was 5.2 into 3.3 centimeters. He underwent left hanging man lachectomy elsewhere. He came for further treatment here. The histology of the uh, archectomy specimen showed NSGCT, which contains teratoma 90%, yolk sac tumor 5%, and embryonal cell carcinoma in 5%. He received five, four cycles of EP. Uh, as we discussed, uh, he was a young patient and he was destined for uh, RPLND. We requested our uh, medical oncologist to give EP regimen. So he received four cycles instead of three cycles of BEP, anticipating the pulmonary complications. So after giving four cycles of EP, AFP was normalized and FDG PET uh, we also did before and after. So FDG PET showed non fdg with 3.2 into 2 centimeter retro cable, 1.6 into 0.9 centimeter intraiotic cable, and 1.7 centimeter paraiotic nodes. So all other blood and urine investigations were normal. We planned for surgery. This is the uh, CT. You can make out the lymph nodes at three sides. So here, big retro, retro, retro cable lymph node and para aortic lymph nodes are there. So one lymph node was in the lower retroperitoneum, lower intra aortic cable region, and one big one was there in the upper intra aortic cable region. So he was advised RPLND. We also explained him about the risk of you know conversion to open. Laparoscopy, of course, it's very challenging. Uh, I've not done any laparoscopic surgeries. I've done only open and robotic. He opted for robotic assisted RPLND. Position was 25 degree Trendlenburg position, head and docking with the SI robo and ports as depicted here. So this is the video, which is self-explanatory. We have discussed all these steps. So first identify the posterior peritoneum. If additions are there, you have to release those additions. And once you cut this peritoneum up to the third part of duodenum, and you cut laterally, it opens like a book. And these peritoneal folds can be hooked or stitched to the anterior abdominal wall so that bubble would not come in between. And you will have great exposure to both great vessels that is iota and ivc so this step generally takes about 20 25 minutes uh, you can use any type of uh, you no know, suturing it can be the suture can be brought outside and the uh, assistant can hold it or generally it can be fixed to the abdominal wall When you fix to the abdominal wall, probably your new more requirement is also relatively less. So we have gone up to the third part of the duodenum. This is the 
left side of the peritoneal fold, which is being stitched after taking care that duodenum is seen and we are not near the duodenum. So here we have used the Velox suture. However, this Velox suture would be utilized to close the posterior peritoneum at the end of the procedure. So here, very important point is uh, we should identify the great vessels. Uh, aortic pulsations can be made out very easily. So you can identify the aorta very easily. Sometimes we may injure the ureter if we start from laterally. So it is always better to start after identifying the aorta. It is difficult to say where to start the dissection. It depends on complexity of the disease. Uh, you start from a virgin area, meaning to say where lymph nodes are not there, you can start your dissection. Here, this is almost lateral to the lateral margin of the IVC we are dissecting, where the lymph node packet was not, you know, not such desmoplastic reaction is there because lymph nodes in this region is not enlarged. We are doing here extended template lymphadenectomy. Uh, as for the, you know, uh, data from uh, MSKCC Shinfield series, 16% of them can have uh, extra template disease. So to avoid that, uh, we have to consider extra template to avoid recurrences. So here I'll be switch switching between para-aortic, intra-aortic cable from uh, time to time. Here the dissection is pre-aortic region. You can make out the pulsations of the aorta. Your assistant should be very well experienced. He should have seen at least a couple of videos. He should have assisted at least open a couple of surgeries. So then only he can assist you better. That's very important. Without good experienced assistant, it's very difficult to perform these surgeries. So a lot of uh, vessels, small arterial branches and even lumbar veins can arise directly from the IVC or the iota. So you should be able to identify that and clip it before it starts bleeding. So that's very important. You can make out the desmoplastic reaction. So always better to go from, uh, uh, you know, from a normal area. You can identify that. So from normal to diseased area, if you go, you get good planes. In this case, it was relatively easy because the contact of the diseased lymph nodes with the great vessels was relatively less. So you can get away without having much problem. So we are doing at the level of the upper intra-aorto cable region. We can make out the pulsation of the uh, aorta on the right side and IVC on the left side. So you get, with this technique and with this approach, a transperitoneal approach, you get very good exposure to both IOTA and uh, IVC. And adequate space will be there for assistant to help and even for you to do the surgery. So your upper limit of dissection is up to the renal vessels. So you should be able to see the right and left renal artery and vein. That is the upper inter aorto cable region where one big lymph node was present. If there is any difficulty, we can go to the other region of the lymph nodes so that you can come from both the sides. All the lumbar vessels which arise directly from the aorta should be tackled very easily. Otherwise, if you don't clip, sometimes catastrophic bleeding can be there. So you should go very slowly, meticulously. You should not hurry while dissecting in this area. You should take your own sweet time. That's very, very important. So you can make out white glistening tissue behind in the intra cable region that is the anterior spinous ligament. So you should be able to see and clear that area completely where you should be able to see the anterior spinous ligament 
from the bifurcation to the hilar region of the kidney. So to avoid lymphocele and uh, vascular problems, use the clips, particularly uh, hemolab clips, generously. Don't compromise on these things. There is a vessel directly arising from the aorta, which was clipped and divided. Now we are working in the intraaortic cable region in the upper retroperitoneum. So that is the left renal vein you can make out joining the IVC. So that is the upper limit. So you can make out the white glistening. ligament. So now we are working in the para-aortic region. We should identify the ureter first to understand the boundaries. So after retracting the ureter, all the lympho areolar tissue, which is all the lymphatics which come from the lower limb and the pelvis should be clipped and divided. As in this case, it's an extended template lymphonectomy. We did complete uh, removal of the common elect lymph nodes as well, up to the bifurcation of the iota and IVC. This is the lower retroperitoneal region where one big lymph node was present. We are dissecting at that level. In this particular case, we could not preserve the neurovascular bundle. And we also sacrificed the uh, inferior mesenteric artery for better dissection and better yield of the lymph nodes. Otherwise, uh, you can preserve the inferior mesenteric artery. Depends on the individual case. So that is the gonadal vein being clipped and divided. You can make out the ureter laterally. That is the lateral boundary. We are working near the left renal hilum. Again, we have to clip the gonadal vein, which joins the left renal vein. You can make out the pulsations of the left renal artery directly arising from the iota. So you can make out the left ureter. That is the left ureter. This is the intraiotal cable region. You can make out the anterior spinous ligament completely. Left renal artery, left renal vein and even right renal artery was seen and the iota was lifted up, uh, remove all the fibro fatty tissue behind the iota, otherwise risk of recurrence will be literally more. So you can make out on the left side, the boundary ureter. So this is the completion of complete template lymphonectomy. So this way the lymph nodes we removed from the upper retroperitoneum and lower retroperitoneum paraiotic lymph nodes along with the calf structures. So docking time was around 210 minutes, blood loss was less than 70 minutes and it was discharged in the second post of day. This is the final outcome. Thank you. Fantastic, uh, amazing uh, video, Raghu. It's, uh... Now, for, for all those people who say that, you know, with, with a robot, you can't give that kind of a clearance that you can with an open surgery, I think they should see your video and they will change their mind. Uh, it's just about the intent. Uh, and uh, you have clearly shown that, you know, even complex procedures can be done safely and efficiently uh, with a robotic approach. Uh, so, uh, you know, you, and you. considering that, you know, these are the, pa these are patients who are going home, you know, starting to eat the very next day after the surgery and going home within two days that this patient uh, did. Uh, it's, it's indeed a, you know, creditable uh, difference that it made when you use a robotic approach for this. What are your comments on that? Uh, yes, uh, uh, that's very important. Uh, some people will have, uh, after this kind of extensive dissection, uh, they can have paralytic ileus and uh, lymphoria can be there. So that complicates. Uh, however, in this particular case, uh, it was... Uh, uh, without any complication, his recovery was he was young and his recovery was uh, absolutely uh, without any events. So we could discharge him on uh, second day. Uh, first day, 
we kept the drain drain output was there but it was not bloody it was only lymph was coming so sometimes if we keep the drain the lymph will go on coming so patient will lose lot of uh, protein through the lymph so to avoid that one we generally make sure as long as it is not bloody we remove the drain so we <clears throat> the, yeah so i mean that that's also a little bit of a, a drain can also be a little bit of a double whammy because uh, sometimes yes, yes. it will keep on draining and then you know first day 100 ml you say oh maybe i'm going to keep it and then the after two days it's 500 ml and you don't you say why did i remove it earlier so it's like sometimes uh, you so, know it's 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 okay to adopt a ostrich mentality and not put the drain at all what do you think yes 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 Uh, you are absolutely right uh, many people are not using the drain at all the, because we work around the great vessels the risk of bleeding can be there even uh, slippage of uh, you know slips happen that happens generally within 24 hours so it's a good policy at least from in our series we always keep the drain for one day and we remove uh, experts like you probably can uh, you know send them home without uh, the drain or you know operate without the drain It's a, <laughs> it depends on the medical surgeon's belief absolutely it's a it's a surgical belief one question that i want to ask you raghu did you consider removing the paracaval and the right common iliac lymph nodes in this uh, would you think that i know it's a bit controversial uh, left, do you feel no, that it's side, required side, no left side common iliac was uh, removed and hmm. uh, complete uh, intraureter cable up to the bifurcation uh, was removed right right So yeah so there there's a little bit of controversy about whether you need to do a bilateral full template in this case or a unilateral full template and i know that this uh, issue has not been resolved in literature uh, but uh, you know some people would want to say that okay we should remove the paracaval and the right common iliac as well w- what do you think about that so it depends on the nodal uh, where where exactly the nodes are present if it is outside the template better to go with uh, bilateral uh, full template uh, lymphectomy uh otherwise risk of recurrence is uh, very high when it recurs it is very difficult to revisit the retroperitoneum again it will complicate further so first time you are going to the re- visiting the retroperitoneum better to complete the job absolutely and what are your comments uh, ragu about going in for a bilateral uh, lateral um, or for that matter a unilateral lateral or a, or a supine position do you feel that one is better than the other your own comments and experience on this if it is if you are planning uh, only uh, template based either right or left then you can uh, adopt both the flank approach is uh, very well uh, you know uh, documented and many people are using only flank approach uh, i am comfortable with uh, supine approach because you will have complete exposure to the great vessels you will have more space uh, in flank approach the problem is uh, you may have to retract the bowel sometimes and if it starts bleeding at the lower end when you are doing the left side if it starts bleeding from the aorta the space will be relatively less so that is one uh, technical uh, point you can consider otherwise you can, both are standard approaches so Absolutely. i can't say one is superior to others but i am comfortable with uh, uh, this approach because i'll have complete exposure bowel will not come you don't need to retract the bowel uh, all the bowel will go uh, uh, towards the upper abdomen and when once you you know uh retract the peritoneal fold you don't see the bowel at all in the operative field absolutely and and you avoid the need for repositioning the patient and redocking the robot and that that takes away a lot of time and and effort right yes 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 in the xi system that is that problem is not there uh the one more advantage of uh, lateral approach or flank approach uh in one docking probably you can remove the uh, spermatic cord or the gonadal vessels so so i guess that's, that's again uh, so ragu i get i think that's also a function of xi versus si uh, yes. because uh, you know like you i also prefer the supine approach uh, and uh, we have uh, published our technique it's not an original technique but we have published our technique in post chemotherapy R- rplnd in in journal of robotic surgery ashwin tamankar our first fellow wrote that about 3 4 years back and in that if you have an si you have to redock the patient to to get the spermatic cord but if you have an xi you can actually you know slant the port positioning right. in such a way that with the same uh, multi quadrant approach you can actually get multi quadrant uh, approach is uh, possible that is so the real a, advantage right. of uh, xi system absolutely absolutely and and with the xi i think uh, it it 
it saves a lot of time because you don't have to redoc and uh, reorient the patient. Uh, just one or two uh, uh, more uh, questions I have for you, Raghu. Yes. Firstly, that, Jagan, you know, this I, have, is... I have one more comment on that. Yes, sure. I have one more comment. If you're doing retroperitoneoscopic uh, approach, you can probably will have complete access to even the uh, no, gonadal vein, even with SI system. Uh, we right. can probably take some cues from uh, Ginnel, Ginnelis with us. Uh, Ginnel is, Gin is the king of retroperitoneoscopy. So yes, I'm yes. sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know the uh, transperitoneal, so I started with uh, retroperitoneal. That is all. But uh, you are <laughs> the, you are the king in the RPL, and you know you have published the largest data on Indian screening along with uh, Ravel sir and yourself. So. Actually, one advantage, as uh, Raghu is telling, in uh, extrapetone life, uh, named it as race, robot assisted uh, supine extrapetone approach. In that uh, advantage is, uh, since we are going from the lateral aspect, one, we can go at, at the same time anterior and posterior to the vessel, then we can go and uh, trace the gonadal up to its uh, joining near the, uh, into the, uh, going into the, uh, into the inguinal ring. So all these things is possible and uh, we can lift everything and go up, up to the opposite side. If there is stay, uh, time, I can share a short video also, but uh, it's uh, optional. But uh, that is one advantage of uh, extrapetronal approach. But the only thing is you should have reasonable uh, experience in extrapetronal or trapetronoscopic surgery. Otherwise, uh, inadvertently, you may enter into the peritoneal cavity and uh, entire space will collapse. And another thing is uh, the assistant also should be well versed. Otherwise, he will pop with his uh, assistant arm into the peritoneal cavity, and that is the end of the story. That is the only yes. reason. Otherwise, I have done a transpetronal and extrapetronal approach. I feel that extrapetronal is better compared to transpetronal, but because there is no bubble there, you can go underneath the vessels better than the transpetronal approach. Absolutely. I think those are great points uh, from Ginil, but just a question that it has a certain learning curve. And for those of us who are not really used to retroperitoneoscopic uh, nephrectomy or retroperitoneoscopic adrenalectomy like Ginel is, I think it may be difficult to start off straight away with an RPL and I totally agree with you. <laughs> right. we, we first started uh, retroperitoneoscopic. Uh, accidentally, my assistant was retracting the peritoneum. Uh, so, pneumo leak happened uh, into the peritoneum. Despite of putting a 5mm port, it was uh, leak was more, we couldn't do that. We, we had to convert that to transpiratorium. However, whatever Ginil said is uh, absolutely very valid points. Experienced uh, assistant is very important. And one important point is don't try to retract with the uh, suction. You can use either grasper or even uh, any other, uh, you know, retractor, not the suction. Suction is likely to, uh, you know, open up the peritoneum. No new molasses very much can happen with that. How, uh, Raghu, how do you prepare for, you know, because you know that there is always a chance of, uh, you know, a sudden bleeding in this situation and needing to convert. How, how do you prepare preoperatively while doing a robotic RPLND uh, to take care and avoid these problems? Uh, one bubble preparation uh, for generally not required. Uh, and when you, I mean, my experience with the uh, transperitoneal uh, approach. Uh, you should be ready with, uh, you know, all the uh, hemolock clips, bulldog clamps should be ready and uh, Sadinsky clamp should be ready. And for, to deal with emergency, uh, you should have a rescue stitch. All those things should be kept and your assistant should be ready and you should be ready to even uh, open up. So open instruments should also be kept ready because uh, in the retroperitoneum, when you are dealing with uh, great vessels, if one major vessel starts bleeding, uh, you will have very less time to, you know, go inside. So all these things should be uh, explained to the assistant, nurse, everything. So we should be ready to open up anytime in case if it is required. Absolutely. I think this is one high risk surgery, which we, uh, you know, uh, which takes away a few days of your life every time you yes. do it. <laughs> and, the time uh, to act is very, very less. So you should yeah. be, you should go in very early in case if any catastrophe happens. Absolutely. And wh what about uh, any special precautions in the post-operative period, uh, especially with regards to DVT and all those issues which are more common in this situation? 
Yes, we do give uh, DVT prophylaxis. Uh, uh, one, we use float run pump and we always use TED stockings. And when it comes to Clexin, we continue Clexin. Um, at least and early ambulation, which is very important. So they should get up and uh, start walking the next day at least. Uh, one question can I ask? Uh, uh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, uh, after uh, cisplatin treatment, uh, we come across a lot of uh, IVC thrombus. Okay, so I also had one patient whom I have to do the cava filter then proceed with surgery. So what is your strategy if there is a IVC thrombus uh, IVC thrombus uh, in the case, so manipulation can be an issue, then uh, what is your strategy? Uh, I have not come across uh, this situation in my series. Uh, if you want to extrapolate the, you know, the similar scenario when we are dealing with uh, IVC thrombus in uh, RCC, it is always better to put a filter. Uh, it's, it's our uh, standard protocol that whenever IVC thrombus is there, we always put a retrievable filter where post-surgery, we can retrieve that. I don't know whether it is appropriate to extrapolate that to uh, here while doing RPLND. I, I don't have any experience. If you have any experience, uh, please share with me. Actually, uh, my first patient had an IVC thrombus where I put a filter. Next week, I'm going to operate another patient where the entire IVC is uh, thrombus. So I don't know whether I have to staple and remove the IVC or should I a dissection, dissecting the uh, because the entire IVC is completely obstructed. So after hey, complete system, obstruction is there. If complete obstruction is there, it's a good idea to uh, resect that completely because collaterals would have developed by now. So you're not going to uh, face any problems or complications by excising the IVC. And you're also going to remove this. It's a, there are two types of thrombus, whether it can be bland thrombus or tumor thrombus. If it is a tumor thrombus, it is always better to excise that part of the IVC. Right. So, and uh, what about, uh, you know, these patients who, you know, in the follow-up, how do you uh, kind of follow these patients? Up? Do, do, do you follow them up? Do the medical oncologists follow them up? Uh, how, what is the protocol in your place? Uh, if the histopathology is negative, there is no tumor, only necrosis is there, probably they may not require any additional chemotherapies. In such cases, we always discuss in the MDT, we always discuss with the medical oncologist, but follow-up is generally with us. Mm -hmm. If any further chemo is required, if viable tumor is there, they would require further uh, additional uh, you know, chemotherapy cycles. In such cases, uh, we interact with them and uh, we send them uh, to receive uh, further chemotherapies. And when it comes to long-term follow-up, they should follow up with both uh, medical oncologists as well as uh, uro oncologist. That's very important. And, and when you when you give these patients, uh, do, do you, you give these patients heparin, right? Low molecular weight heparin? Yes, 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 yes. yes. How long would you continue that for in RPLN? Generally, uh, the you know guideline says that we had to give for at least 28 days, four weeks. But four weeks, we don't practice. As long as they are staying in the hospital, we give. Afterwards, we encourage them to ambulate and we use TED stockings. This is the you know uh, what we practice in uh, uh, in clinical practice what we follow at least Absolutely. i don't yeah. i'm not prescribing for uh, you know 28 days right so i yeah I, that, I think that's pretty you know straightforward and honest answer i think yeah, with regards to the I, I don't know is there a lesser tendency for indians to to have uh, dvt uh, but i think these uh, the RPLND and groin lymph node dissection are probably two, two uh, surgeries in which we have to go to as much extreme as we want with regard to that. I, yes. for, for that matter, we don't even give heparin to patients uh, uh, for robotic prostatectomy, but these are patients who definitely deserve uh, more DVT yeah. profile access. And, and finally, uh, Raghu, I think it's been a fantastic uh, presentation and a great learning experience for all of us uh, today listening to your experience and your presentation uh, before we wrap up i want to ask you uh, you know for a few pearls of uh, wisdom for people who are you know starting to do this procedure not people like ginil uh, you know who are masters in their own right but people who are just starting to do this procedure uh, you know thinking about doing their first robotic rplnd uh, what tips would you uh, give uh, to to them do it don't do it you know <laughs> <laughs> so if you're just beginning uh, your uh, robotic uh, program, uh, 
uh, better not to venture into this. You should have at least experience of uh, doing a couple of uh, open RP LNDs, assisting a couple of uh, open RP LNDs, uh, assisting a couple of uh, robotic RP LNDs to your seniors or experts. And you should have done at least a few cases of uh, complex, uh, you know, uh, robotic surgeries. Uh, need not be RP LNDs. Uh, and when you're taking up these cases, don't take up uh, highly challenging cases where disease burden is more. Uh, take, choose simple cases where one or two lymph nodes are there or three, four lymph nodes are there, small tumors are there, maybe two centimeter or maximum three centimeter tumors. So better to choose that kind of a, uh, you know, patients than choosing a very complex five, six centimeter uh, nodes. So these are my tips. So if you want to say in one sentence, after sufficient experience with open and robotic, then you start. Otherwise, better not to start this. How many robotic cases in neuro-oncology should you have under your belt before doing a robotic RP LND? Oh, it's a very difficult question. Uh, it, it <laughs> that's that's the... why I asked you this question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I had done uh, many open uh, complex surgeries. Uh, it is not just RP LNDs. If you know, if you have dealt with uh, many complex, uh, you know, uh, other uh, uro-oncological surgeries, radical prostatectomies, and uh, many PLNDs, uh, even uh, RP LND sometimes, I mean, uh, RP LND for sometimes we do for uh, RCCs. If you have done a good number of cases, probably you can uh, uh, venture into this RPLNDs. Particularly post chemo RPLNDs are uh, challenging. Um, probably you choose pre chemo or prophylactic RPLND or therapeutic RPLNDs where the disease burden is less. Uh, such cases you can choose to begin with. So that, that will give you a lot of confidence. Then you can probably go for uh, post chemo. Absolutely. I think those are great uh, points, uh, Raghu. Uh, and uh, you know, as as you all know, this uh, re the video recording of this webinar would be available in about a week's time in the Vaticuti uh, Foundation website. So, uh, you want to share this with your friends and share the link, and and if they want to have a look at it, of course you can, and of course you can revisit this uh, again. Uh, and uh, and Raghu has his TED talk also online, and and if you if you you, you should really listen to it if you if you want to really know the how he's able to convince the lay people with regards to how why robotic surgery is the best thing to happen uh, in recent times um, Raghu, please share your ted talk link whenever uh, we have this opportunity and uh, sure, thank you it's my pleasure and uh, and i would like to wrap up this program now with, uh, with thanks to uh, dr bhandari and the vaticuti team uh, Dave, Giovanna, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, it's, it was absolutely wonderful to be a part of this program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Gagan. Thank you, Bandari, sir. Uh, thank you, Dave. Uh, and thank you, Vatikuti Foundation and Ginil for joining and uh, uh, giving us a lot of tips with retroperitoneoscopic surgery. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Gagan and uh, mm, uh, Raghu for this wonderful presentation and Jinil who was a bonus uh, as a participant and we look forward to go a little more in depth and conduct some master classes so we'll be happy this is the gift of COVID and uh, unfortunately we can't think of having a RSC meeting in near future let us see how things unfold thank you very much stay safe and uh, I once again appreciate your time on Saturday. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. It was a really fascinating presentation, and the discussion was great after as well. It was nice to have, have such a good discussion. And with that, we're going to say goodbye from Detroit and from India. And I want to thank all of the guests that joined us today, too. I hope you will let your friends know about the video. In two weeks, we're going to have another webinar on robotic kidney transplant. And as you know, this is near and dear to the Vatikuti Foundation's uh, goals and, and hearts in many ways. You know, they've been involved with it right from the start with Dr. Menon and Dr. Alawat and now Dr. Kumar and Kishore, who are going to be presenting a fascinating presentation in, in two weeks. I hope everyone can join us for it. More information is on the website. 
and will be posted on our social media. So with that, I'm going to say good day, and we appreciate everyone joining us. Thank you.